Hi, this is John Reinecker, Technical Services Manager at Kermitico in Benicia, California. Today we have another in our series of HVAF informational webinars, and today's subject is on HVAF tungsten carbide and what is so special about it. The best place to start here would be a comparison between HVOF tungsten carbide cobalt chrome and HVOF tungsten carbide cobalt chrome. If we look at the OF version of the coating, we find typically the porosity of such coatings is between a half and one percent. If we look at our HVAF 8610-4 coating, we find that generally the porosity is less than half a percent, and that's too fine of a, a, of a detail to find in traditional metallography. So we use our gas permeability tester. More information about that can be found on our website at chromatico.com. When we use our gas impermeability tester, we find that 8610-4 coatings generally uh, are impermeable to 300 psi nitrogen at thicknesses of 50 microns or about two thousandths of an inch. Then, in HVOF, we have typical hardness of about 1100 to 1250 on the Vickers scale, 300 gram load. And we have the ability with our HVAF process to tune the hardness and the cost to your needs. So we can create a coating that we call economy uh, at 1200 HV 300, which is roughly equivalent to a, an OF coating. DE is pretty high, approaching 60, 65%, but the coating is not impermeable at 50 microns. The balanced mode coating comes in at around 1350 on the Vickers scale, and that is an impermeable coating, uh, moderately cost. As we'll get into the details on DE in a, a couple slides uh, forward. And finally, we have the uh, ultra mode, which comes in above 1600 on the Vickers 300 gram scale. Pretty tough coating. It's also very ductile. In the case of HVOF, Coatings harder than 1200 uh, on the Vickers scale are generally overstressed and significantly decarburized. Our coatings, on the other hand, retain their ductility and, in fact, are extremely cavitation resistant. More data on this will follow as well. When we spray a coating, we get a deviation in hardness uh, of 50 to 60 points. That's from the highest to the lowest. Uh, reading of 10 readings that generally generate the average that's reported. In the case of HVOF, you typically find 150 to 200 points deviation in Vickers hardness. Then there's the spray rate. HVOF is capable of, of throwing uh, 4 to 5 kilograms an hour, roughly 11 pounds an hour max, uh, and the coating is built up at a rate of only 5 to 10 microns per pass. That's a quarter to half a mil per pass. In our case, uh, our HVAF process can spray at up to 33 pounds an hour. We don't usually do much below 15 kilograms an hour. Uh, that's 33 kilograms an hour, not pounds. And uh, that's, that's pushing uh, 65 pounds an hour. And we build our coatings at up to 50 microns a pass. That's two thousandths per pass. So an HVAF carbide coating takes a lot fewer passes to get the job done. Now, in HVOF carbide coating, once you, once you stop the job, you're pretty much done. You can't do a local repair. Uh, we will show you how we can do a local repair with our HVAF process later in this presentation. Here we have a, a number of HVOF guns compared to our HVAF gun in, in schematic view. And uh, the first and most important difference is that, well, our schematic is in color. No, that's not, not really so important. These drawings are all aligned at the powder injection point for each of the various guns, where the powder hits the, the heat source. And as you can see, our powder path is much, much longer. Uh, we have slow powder movement through the combustion chamber, where the gentle heating of the particle brings it to a temperature that is ideally below the melting point. Then we have a nozzle which can be as long as necessary uh, to get acceleration that may be as high as gas velocity if that were desirable. So we have a slow gentle heating and a long power pa uh, powder path that doesn't have much in the way of turbulence. Uh, if you look at these um, 
uh, radial injection. Uh, obviously, the powder's got to make a 90 degree turn. It's going to go all over the place. Here, we don't have the powder making the bend. We have the gases making the bend in a jet coat type gun. Uh, obviously, turbulence is going to result. And it's going to disturb the powder path. And uh, in the case of the diamond jet, uh, we have a uh, axial injection, small combustion chamber, and that there's no control of that combustion. It's just all those gases are mixed and lit. It's very, very uh, uh, multi-directional. So that has to disturb the powder stream. One would think. In our case, uh, our gases, the mixed gases, are delivered through a catalytic element through hundreds and hundreds of little itty bitty holes. And the flame that forms is really a series of hundreds of small flames. So it's a very orderly uh, combustion process, very smooth flow from the combustion chamber into the nozzle, and out we go uh, to the substrate. Uh, because all of the powder particles see essentially the same environment from the time they enter the combustion chamber until they're accelerated towards the part, the consistency is very high. Here we have some uh, coating sprayed by others. It was sprayed by Hunan University. So here we have an AK-7 coating, and that is not the best metallography I've ever seen for any of our coatings, but it's certainly significantly and obviously better than the JP-5000 coating they created and way better than the JETCO coating that looks like something from a geology textbook. Here we have the numbers. The AK coating came in at 1326, plus or minus 100 points. Porosity 0.3%. Fracture toughness was high at almost 6. And the, this is most interesting. The ratio of W2C to tungsten carbide, 0. We have no W2C, no decarburization of the WC, no W2C creation. In the case of the JP5000, 0.12% uh, um, was the, uh, well, it's 0.12 to 1 uh, W2C creation. And in the jet coat, it was 0.7, significantly higher. Here we have an uh, example of metallography that's much more typical for our HVAF carbide coating. This happens to be 8812, sprayed with propane, came in at 1540 HV300. But what's most important about this slide is this X-ray diffraction analysis, comparing the powder to the coating. And as you can see, they are identical. And um, you see a little theta phase that was probably in the original powder. Oh, yeah, there it is. Everything that was in the original powder shows up in the coating. Uh, that is unusual for thermally applied coatings. This is not the case for HVOF coatings, where W2C is generally created, among other things. Now, here we have one of the most interesting characteristics of our HVAF tungsten carbide coating. It is widely known that hard surfaces resist particle erosion when the angle of incidence is shallow, and tough surfaces resist particle erosion when the impingement angle is closer to a right angle or 90 degrees. Here we have three different uh, materials, an HVOF coating, a fuse coating, and our AK06 HVAF tungsten carbide cobalt chrome. What's interesting here is that the 90 degree angle of impingement wore at precisely half the rate of the 30 degree impingement, which is exactly the opposite for all the traditional coating approaches. The coating retains its ductility and provides a level of toughness uh, not seen in tungsten carbide coatings uh, up until now. Here we have yet another evaluation. Uh, this was a GTV uh, K2 process, highly regarded in Europe as, as uh, the preeminent HVOF process. And their ultra HVOF process, which uses finer particles to create higher particle velocity. Three tests were done. Uh, G65 uh, rubber wheel sand, uh, an, a G75 slurry erosion test, and a ball on disc um, uh, test for 10,000 cycles. Now look at these data. Clearly, the Kermetico coating did better in all regards across the boards. Um, Interestingly enough, the Ultra HVOF on the uh, rubber wheel uh, sand test, the result was only slightly worse than our HVAF version of the same coating. Interestingly enough, that has to do with hardness in the HVOF, uh, Ultra HVOF coating rather, uh, did produce a very hard coating. And that is clear by the slurry erosion test in which it did very poorly 
hard coatings don't do well in slurry erosion because you have the added uh, component of potential cavitation and hard coatings don't do well in that. They're brittle and they fracture and particles fall out and coating wears. So we have a high wear rate for something that requires toughness and that's, that's generally the case across the boards. Our coating, much better in all regards and that's due to the uh, toughness of the coating due to the retention of ductility among other things. Here we have the salt spray test and, and this is interesting you know the folks who did this test in Omat uh, weren't biased at all in the corrosion test they used our ball on disc specimen which did better than any of the other coatings tested obviously uh, and they used that for the salt spray test um, clearly trying to stack the deck in their favor but here we can see that their OF coating is a significant amount of corrosion showing by the change in color the ultra uh, HV OF coating also shows a significant change in color. And here's our coating after it got beat up in the ball on disc test. There's virtually no color change in the unaffected areas. So there you have it. Uh, much tighter, much more corrosion resistant coating. Here's another example of how we compare to traditional HVOF coatings. This work was done by Schlumberger in the UK. It was a competitive slurry erosion test and among other things they checked hardness. So here we have the highest hardness of the lot tested. Now you got to believe that these guys used not their worst vendors, but the best they had. So here's the best they can offer. And look at those hardness numbers, significantly lower than ours. This one's not much, much lower. But look at that standard deviation. 233 points on the hardness scale deviation from the high to the low. We're at 53. Uh, the others, well, you know, they're, they're all over the map and none of them got even close to where we're at. This can be looked at as a percentage and uh, a percentage of the relative standard. We're at 3.9 percent, extremely consistent result, whereas the average of all the OF coatings, much, much, um, much, much higher deviation, clearly. Now, I had mentioned earlier that we can uh, create three different versions of our coating. We have the economy version, the balance, and the ultra mode. What's going on here is this. In solid particle technology, as we are not purposefully trying to melt anything, just heat it to near its liquid phase temperature, we have two competing processes that are uh, at play here. The deposition of material and the blasting of material with those solid particles. What happens is well-bonded particles stay put and survive the blasting, where poorly bonded uh, particles will uh, be blasted away. So if we increase the velocity, we get more blasting, we get a higher quality coating because more junk is removed, but the cost also goes up because the DE is going down. So the economy uh, coating is the most cost effective, but it has, uh, you know, properties that meet HVOF specs, nothing special. Balanced uh, mode is slightly more expensive and uh, that will exceed HVOF specifications and the ultra mode is just outstanding beyond any limit ever imagined for any tungsten carbide coating created by any method. And here we have some of the numbers. Economy mode gets you 1050 to 1250 with 8 tenths percent porosity and a DE of approaching 65 percent. Every once in a blue moon we might pass 65 percent but that is not the norm. Let's not exaggerate too much here. Balance mode gets you 1250 to 1350 on the Vickers scale with a porosity of less than half a percent at a respectable 48 to 58 percent DE. In round numbers, let's call it 55 percent. And ultra mode will get you from 1350 to over 1600 HV300 with a generally about three tenths percent porosity, um, as I said, immeasurable in met metallography, with a DE of 36 to 42 percent. Uh, not too shabby considering that because of the quality of this coating, you can use a much thinner coating than can be used with an HVOF coating. And no seal is required because nothing gets through it. We have a coating uh, in the balance mode that uh, in 10,000 thickness is seeing 15,000 PSI with no sealer. Um, the other component of HVOF that we do not share is that we have much higher spray rates, as I had mentioned before. Here are the numbers. If we're spraying a 38 millimeter, about an inch and a half diameter shaft, we spray at about 25 kilograms an hour, just over 50 pounds an hour. 
And if the OD is 300 millimeters or uh, 330, as this one here is about a foot, uh, that spray rate is 32 kilograms an hour, about 65 pounds an hour. And we remember, we're building that at up to 2,000s per pass, so many fewer passes are required to get the job done, much less heat input, much less time spent watching the part cool off. Here we have another comparison uh, of weight loss during a silt erosion test. Uh, here we are compared to a JP5000, compared to our balance mode coating, and at this time we had an Ultra 1 and an Ultra 2. Uh, different hardware was used, but as you can see, all of our coatings have a respectable low erosion rate uh, given the time frame, and uh, compared to a JP, it's not even close. Here we have an application that we do. Uh, hydropower uh, turbines and components are well suited to, co uh, uh, ser well served by coatings uh, of the HVOF variety because of the ductility and cavitation resistance. So here we have a, a Francis runner being coated, and here we have a, uh, this is a wicket gate head. It goes at the top of the assembly of wicket gates around the Francis turbine, and uh, that controls the flow of water in. A lot of cavitation, a lot of silt erosion. Our coating works very well in that application. Here we have another application that is unique, in my opinion. Not, the, not that we're spraying an auger. Lots of folks with lots of processes spray augers. But we can put one millimeter of 86104 on that auger. That's 40 thousandths thick of 86104. Uh, makes for a very durable part. Here we have another application that cannot be done by any other method. This is a tensometer roll. Uh, it's used in a steel mill and it consists of a series of, of rings stacked up next to each other. They're supported by uh, pressure sensors inside the roll and they send out signals about the pressure of the steel on the roll during production so the, uh, all the, the rolls can be adjusted to achieve the right result in terms of uh, finish and, and, and all of the things that matter in a steel mill. But what's interesting about this job? 1.8 millimeters thick, 70 thousandths of 86.10.4. No problem. And this takes a very high finish. We also do a lot of chrome plate replacement for things like hydraulic rods. Um, we did, oh, probably 30 of them or so, uh, maybe 36 for a local refinery. Their dock cranes. Uh, were lasting about six months because of pitting in a severe marine environment. Uh, we've coded now, as I said, about three dozen or so, and they have been in service for over five years. It's pushing six and a half years as I make this uh, uh, webinar. Pretty good performance. And about a year ago, I inquired as to how they were doing, and the report was, well, they still pretty much look like they did when we put them in service, so they're fine. That's good news. Now, earlier on, I had mentioned that we can repair a tungsten carbide coating, and there's two conditions. Once the coating has been ground, we can add more material to that coating, as long as the coating is 2,000 thick after finishing per side. So if, if for some reason you came up short in the grinding, uh, make sure you got room for 2,000 of finished coating, and uh, apply more coating, finish grinding, and you're back in business. If the coating has not yet been ground, we simply preheat it back to the target temperature and continue spraying as if nothing had happened at all. And we've even done this when the, uh, the part uh, got into the grinder and was found to be uh, running uh, untrue. Uh, run out was exceeded the coating thickness. So now the part is covered with uh, all kinds of coolant from the grinder, but we put enough material on so that it can be ground true and round and save the part. Run out was reduced to tolerable levels. And we can repair coating uh, that is blistered or damaged. Uh, this was a repair part we did here in our shop and it had old coating on it and apparently all of it wasn't removed because when the coating got built up it bubbled. So what we did was first we ground it to a feather edge in, uh, to the adjacent uh, coating and then we blast it. Here's one that's nicely blasted, here's one that's in the works, and here's one that didn't even get started. After, Well, it got dusted off, apparently. After the blasting is complete, we mask it with a shadow mask, 
and spray it uh, just like we normally would spray uh, the part as if you know nothing had happened except we're not rotating the part now and what we end up with is a dot as a repair if this were going to be ground it would be fine but this one was used in its as sprayed state so off it goes with a nice little spot uh, where it was repaired here's another example this was done by placard uh, a customer of ours in the russian federation also our distributor uh, they had a little uh, uh, defect there don't know what caused it but they repaired it and it's gone and just to show that that's not a fluke here's another one uh, same same quality of repair that's going to be fine once it hits the field much better than stripping the coating off the entire part and doing it over and here is one demonstration that absolutely must be seen and I'll uh, uh, narrate this as we go um, one day we were in the office and Andrew said to me, hey, have you ever seen the hardness published for a tool bit for the lathe? He said, no. He showed me. I said, geez, what do you think? He says, I don't know. Let's go try it. So he took three pieces of half-inch square stock and applied two and a half millimeters. That's a hundred thou of 86104 to one face of each of them. Then we took those blanks. Actually, we took one of them. And we did some grinding on it. Nothing special. Little uh, diamond wheel on a bench grinder and shaped it into a metal cutting tool bit that looks like this. And that's how it looked after the grinding and before we cut steel with the coating. That's right, we cut steel with an 8610 coating applied to a half inch piece of square stuff. And when we were done, getting done here, moving along, the tool bit looked exactly as it did before we cut the steel. That's amazing, truly amazing. So the question is, do you think your carbide coating can do that? I have a funny feeling it probably cannot. And here we have uh, our, our uh, distributors. Regardless of where you are in the world, there's probably somebody who can take care of your needs locally. Uh, we have China Oriental RenPro. Uh, Italy, we have Surface Coating Solutions. In Poland, we have TMC Poland. India has SprayMet. Korea um, has Eutectic Korea. Japan, New Metals and Chemicals Company is uh, a distributor of ours. In Russia, we have Placart. They're also a job shop. In Southeast Asia, we have Bexon Global. Uh, they provide coating services as well. And in the East Coast, we have Plasma Powders and Systems. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch our webinar today. And I uh, hope you come back for the next one real soon. Thanks for your time and be well.